Impact Hustlers, the podcast on entrepreneurs and change makers that are creating solutions to the world's biggest problems. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward2030.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact. And this is your host, Michael Shafra. This is Impact Hustlers, the podcast on the entrepreneurs that solve the world's biggest social and environmental problems. And I'm your host, Michael Schaffrath. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, leave a review and share the episode, most importantly, with a friend. To keep updated on new episodes, visit impacthustlers.com and sign up for our email alerts. And follow us on Twitter as well at Impact Hustlers. Enjoy today's episode and let's go. In today's episode, I speak to Dr. Nick Taylor, co-founder and CEO of Unmind, a platform on a mission to help employees manage their mental health and creating a happier workplace. Nick is a clinical psychologist by training, working with the National Health Service in the UK for many years before founding Unmind in 2016. Since then, Unmind has raised close to £5 million pounds in funding and attracted customers like the John Lewis Partnership, for example. It's great to have you on the show, Nick. Hi, great to be here. Thank you. Why does mental health matter to you personally? Why do you think it's important to dedicate a large share of your life now to this topic? Yeah, I guess loads of things probably fed into it, but I think probably the earliest influence for me was growing up with, I had three sisters. My middle sister is called Jessica and she's Down syndrome and Growing up, for me, as a young person watching someone see the world differently and see the world treat someone differently instilled in me quite a, a curiosity about why are some people different, what does it mean to be human, and I think that young experience fundamentally informed my interest growing up. For, fast forward about 20 years, I did my first degree in classical music, and I actually wrote my dissertation looking at the use of a composer called Gregory Ligeti's music in Stanley Kubrick's films and the more I read about film music the more I realized that it's actually psychology and, uh, and you use it to influence people's mood states and I started reading more and more about psychology graduated from my degree and started working for Mind as a support worker supporting people in a range of different ser frontline services with severe and enduring mental ill health and just fell in love with that work and then realized at that point there was a psychologist who was very influential on me there and watching him work made me realize that that's the role I wanted to kind of grow into. And then you started working with the, within the NHS system as a clinical psychologist so you would see patients with mental health issues. Yeah day. well there was I had to go back to university do a psychology diploma which is kind of an accelerated degree and then a doctorate in clinical psychology and then by the end of my 20s was back in London working full-time for an NHS trust called the Maudsley which is South London Morty. I think one of the world's most eminent mental health institutions. It's linked to the Institute of Psychiatry. And I started working there and lecturing in mental health at places like King's College London and UCL, and then moved into a leadership role in the NHS. Yeah. All right. And you were working there for a few years. And at some point, you realized, I want to change careers a bit. I want to actually start a company. I don't want to be within the NHS system anymore. Why did you decide that? Was it because you saw everything was broken in that system or was it a different motivation why did you decide to actually become a founder after that yeah i mean i think if you had met me as a kind of seven-year-old boy and asked me what i wanted to do i would have told you i wanted to run a company i think i wanted to run a restaurant first and then a company so for me in a way the surprise was always that i ended up in the nhs not that i ended up leaving the nhs to start a company so i kind of follow my passion but actually what happened for me over those years working in frontline mental health services was I saw a lot of wonderful practice and some brilliant initiatives and great care. But I also saw three things regularly that really frustrated me. The first was that I've never met anyone at the right time on their journey towards mental ill health. I've only ever met people too late. And it's much harder to help someone if you meet them too late than if you meet them early on in their problem. And it's not fair that someone should ever have to live with a health condition and not have it treated. The second frustration was that I think it's really hard for people to gain access to the right information to look after their mental health. I think it's 
difficult space to navigate and i think that's getting better now but the third was that uh, we don't focus on prevention and that's really astonishing given that we f- are so good at prevention in other areas of our health care such as our teeth or our bodies but with our minds i think we are only now coming to the realization prevention is so important so it was very frustrating those three things in my day-to-day life as a clinician and it was those frustrations that led me to want to leave mm-hmm. the nhs and the initial problem you observed is, okay, there needs to be some sort of uh, prevention, some service or product that maybe solves this problem and gets people to manage their mental health early on. Now, there's a range of product by now in terms of managing your mental health. There's a company called Calm. There's Headspace for meditation. How was your journey from taking the decision of, okay, I've got to start a company in that space to actually realizing selling to corporates or big companies the b2b model would be the best way to solve this problem so you know for me personally the real moment of realization that i wanted to shift came when i was leading as one of the leaders of nhs team and we had very high levels of absenteeism presenteeism and staff turnover because of mental health and we found it hard to attract the best people because of the culture so i became really fascinated with how can organizations look after their people in such a way that they can improve the mental health of their people, create positive environments for the mental health of their people. So for me, the B2B model was always fascinating because that was the problem I was trying to fix. You know, how can organizations better look after their people? So when I look at people like Calm or Headspace or Simple Habit or any of these mindfulness platforms, I think they've done an incredible job in developing a mindfulness platform for consumers. And I think this helped to normalize the narrative around there being tools that you can do on a daily basis to look after your mental health. But I think when you're talking about organizational mental well-being, you need to take a much more holistic approach, both from a scientific underpinning perspective, but also from a platform functionality perspective as well. It's not acceptable just to have a platform that delivers mindfulness bite-sized chunks. You need to make sure there's clinical measurement. You need to make sure there's signposting and integration. You need to make sure there's learning and development. You know, the breadth of what a business focused platform needs to do is so much greater than a consumer mindfulness platform Mm -hmm. and by now your platform is used within a range of different companies from different sizes i think from small companies to large companies like the john lewis partnership here in the uk talk us a bit through how the platform actually works how do employees use it and how does it help them so there's two aspects to the platform the first is that we empower employees to look after their mental health proactively. And the second is that we enable organizations to become data-driven in their mental health strategies. So the first part, as a user of an organization, so for example, William Hill is one of our clients. When you, as an employee at William Hill, get access to Unmind, it takes you a couple of minutes to download and be onboarded onto the platform. And the first place you'll be signposted to is called the Unmind Index. And that's an assessment tool that you can just use to see how you're doing in your mental health, looking at areas like calmness, happiness, coping, sleep, health, energy, etc. You complete this questionnaire, it gives you your unique score profile, and based on that, it will then signpost you to content on the platform that's appropriate to you. That could be learning and development programs that take between three to five weeks to complete, covering the whole spectrum of mental health, how to focus, how to sleep, how to understand common mental health problems, whatever it might be or to tools which are much more ad hoc in the moment exercises that you can do. And all the content is based on cognitive behavioral therapy, neuroscience, positive psychology and mindfulness, a very eclectic scientific underpinnings. So you can complete that content. But then there's a couple of other features as well that bring value. So one is you can check your mood on a daily basis just to give yourself a sense of how you're doing over time. But also we will signpost you to every other service available in your organization so that we can ensure people get to the right care at the right time, wherever they are on that mental health spectrum. Now, from an organizational perspective, we can aggregate and anonymize that data. And the anonymization is crucial because the privacy of the user is our number one priority. But what an organization can then see in unprecedented detail is trends within the mental health of their people. And that allows them to then implement the new offerings and design strategies based on how all of their people are meaning that the engagement utilization of those will be brilliant because they're really well suited to the needs of their people do you find it or maybe initially when you started out did you find it hard to build a trust with the employees i can imagine i've been working in different organizations i think i've never seen really a place where people felt really happy with calling in sick and being like, I'm dealing with my mental health issues right now. I need to call in sick. They maybe just said, 
might have a flu or something like that, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think there's still a lot of stigma around mental health and kind of being open about it in the workplace. Um, did it take quite some effort to kind of try to build the trust of employees to actually put in their data essentially into a platform that, you know, the employer has some control over or like there might be the doubt that something might happen with the data, right? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, there's a statistic in the UK that nine out of 10 employees won't tell their employer about their mental health. It really shows the level of anxiety people have about sharing that information. And sometimes rightly so, because there are real life examples of people being put in very difficult situations because they've shared stories about their mental health. And thankfully, that is changing. We have never actually been asked questions by employees about their data or how we're treating it. And I think that is testament to the onboarding process. We make it extremely clear from day one that the privacy of their data is... Sacred. Sacred. <laughs> yeah. No, well, sorry. <laughs> Too early in the morning. <laughs> and that's our number one priority. So we go out of our way to make that point. I think also it comes down to our messaging around the platform as well. We put a lot of time and thought into the language that we use. Our client success team do a lot about the campaigns that we launch in companies. So hopefully when people come to the platform, they don't feel any anxiety around that because they are reassured from day one that actually data is very safe in that space. Mm -hmm. And then dealing with the problem of stigma around mental health more generally, how did you encounter that when building your product and talking to employers did you find that that's still like a really big issue and did that kind of hinder you of selling your product or did it help you like how do you view the stigma around mental health yeah i mean the stigma is a fascinating subject and i think for a long time the conversation around mental health has focused on the kind of one in six people the people who have mental health problems and probably most articles that you read in the newspaper when it's related to mental health are about mental health problems but the reality is mental health is not something we only get when we have a problem it's something we have from the moment we're born to the moment we die for our entire life we have mental health and so too does everyone around us and i think it's really important to recognize that and to start celebrating our mental health when it's good and recognizing all the unique ways in which it impacts on our life by talking about mental health, health is something we all have all of the time it helps to normalize the subject and helps to break the stigma. I also think there are some important things that we could be doing to help those people that find the conversation hard. Little things like when we give people our scores on the online platform, you get a score for your happiness, not your depression. It's actually just the other word at the other end of the spectrum. So we can just use language really carefully to neutralize the subject a bit. Yeah, I think that's the main thing for us. That helps. Okay. Uh, what, was that a bit of a journey to come up with the right product to solve this? I mean, one thing is the science behind it, but then building it into a product that actually works. How do you go about that? Yeah, that's a great question. We're really lucky at our mind to have an incredible team of people. I think as much as in his kind of traditional mental health services, you need a multidisciplinary teams called the MDT, which will be made up of psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, nutritionists, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, etc. I think in digital mental health, we need a multidisciplinary team 2.0. So yes, the science is important. So you need your clinicians and your academics. But you also need your product designers. You need your engineers. You need your data scientists. You need your designers. Yeah, You need a whole range of different people with their different lenses to bring the platform to life. So I think making sure the right team was in place, but then also really listening very carefully to what the companies were looking for, what the well-being groups within those companies were looking for, and making sure that as our product has evolved, it's done so on the feedback we've got from our users and from the companies that we're serving. I want to talk a bit about basically the problem a bit more if we look at mental health obviously it's a right thing to do to support people with their mental health and managing it but especially with employers there's also a business case for that right and i think when people go to your website they can have a look at that how the statistics actually work out for your organization based on your size talk us a bit through that like what does mental health and the non-management of it actually mean for employers and what's the business case behind actually paying you some money to deal with that yeah i think that's a very important point to make which is that Whilst for us, we talk about mental health something we all have all of the time and therefore we should be proud to be looking after it all of the time. There is an aspirational aspect to our messaging, but the reality is 
the scale of the problem that we face is ginormous. And that is not an aspirational thing. There is a very, very real big problem here that is impacting on organizations on a daily basis that needs to be addressed. I think if you look at, for example, the Stevenson Pharma review that was published in 2017, it was underpinned by research from Deloitte. They showed that the cost to UK employers annually of mental ill health in the UK is £37 billion. That's an enormous figure. This is a real cost. The leading cause of absenteeism, presenteeism, and staff turnover is mental ill health. We know that this has a very bad impact on businesses. So the reason that organizations care is because they know that they have a real problem and they have to address that problem. But I actually think moving forwards, what I hope to see is that people coming into the workplace are going to vote with their feet and only go to work at organizations that are shown to, and known to care about their employees' well-being. Organizations have a responsibility to look after the well-being of their people. And I hope that moving forwards, people coming into the workplace will only choose to work in organizations that do care. What are you competing with, actually? If you sell to organizations, would they be using currently? Is there like nothing they're using or is it maybe a more analog version of, you know, referring employees to coaches or counselors or so? What is it that you're up against when you? I think primarily there is a kind of gap, right, in terms of preventative, proactive solutions in mental health. If there is stuff going on in that space, traditionally it's face to face which can be incredibly effective and engaging, but the reality is it's not scalable either from a practical perspective or from a cost perspective. In terms of the more reactive services, there's a selection of different things available, some good, some bad. Primarily, I think there is a real gap in a service that ensures that employees have the right care at the right time for their mental health. Amazing. I want to go back a bit to your founding journey. And we've had many entrepreneurs on this podcast. And anybody that listens to it knows that it's always hard to build any company, whatever problem you're solving. Um, so let's talk a bit about that. What's been like the hardest challenges that you had to overcome in, in the journey from the first idea to now having big clients using your platform? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, what a journey. It's kind of one of the so many things you don't know when you start that it's probably quite important you don't know those things. I think there's been a lot of points when it's been really tough. I think the really early days getting the first investment was really hard. Before product, when you just have an idea and as a clinical psychologist, not like I've just come out of Harvard Business School. So I think getting people to engage and believe in the mission that we were on very early was a challenge. And I think also it's about be focused. I find that incredibly hard. There are so many wonderful, exciting things that you could pursue at any point in the journey. And it's making sure you pick your battles and you say, right, that's the priority. That's the priority. And then getting the wider team to have the right resources and processes in place to ensure that we as an organization are able to focus collectively on problems when they occur or challenges that we're working on. So those are, I think, early initial fundraising and the ensuring focus. Those are the two big challenges. What do you recommend to founders that are starting out and maybe struggle with the initial fundraise? Is it that they need to find angel investors that really deeply care about the mission that you're on, especially if you're kind of a mission-driven company that solves like a social or environmental problem? Or who are the people that are actually most likely to fund you in these early days? Who funded you in the end where most people didn't care enough to fund you, but then you got some funding eventually, right? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think probably the type of investors that have come on at different points in the journey are quite distinct of one another. Very, very early on, the initial investment came from friends and family and people. So it really was a friends and family round. With that very early investment, we were able to create enough of an MVP to be able to demonstrate value, start running pilots to show a bit of traction. And that enabled us to get investment from more sophisticated angels that we didn't know in our network but brought huge value because either of their passion or understanding for space or because of their knowledge of the kind of HR tech benefit space. And then that then allowed us to grow to the point where we generated revenue and the pipeline was growing, etc. And that then allowed us to bring in institutional money. So it was probably looking back quite important to go through each of those stages because each set of investors has a different set of things they'll be looking for but for me when i see those very early investors the friends and family investors and, and chat with them i 
can't tell you how grateful I am for them taking a punt because it was hugely risky for them and just you know really honored that they were able to invest that money at that stage in relation to like general advice for people I always think that's such a tricky question because everyone's journey is a little bit different and everyone has a different experience and I guess the main thing is just to find brilliant people to go on the journey with do you find maybe also if you talk to other founders that run different companies do you find it was harder for you as a company that solves like a big social problem like mental health or a health problem to fundraise or do you find it's hard for most people is there a difference I think it's probably hard for most people, but we have a real great place here and we get to play the fun startup tech fast growth game. But we know that if we do our job right, we are fundamentally improving the mental health of people. So there's a very, very strong purpose for us as a business and we know that we have an opportunity to do good. That is definitely advantageous in terms of building a passionate team on a mission and growing the team that I think is really, really valuable. In terms of investment, I think essentially for investment to come in, you've got to have a viable business model, regardless of whether you're doing good or not. If you go down the model, we've gone from a fundraising perspective. And we do because of the model we have that so works. Amazing. Let's look at the future. If you think about the next 10 years, if Unmind succeeds in your mission, how does the world look like in 10 years? So I find it hard to predict tomorrow. <laughs> But uh, look, for us, we believe everyone has the right to a healthy mind. We have global ambitions to become the platform that is used by organizations around the world to ensure that all their people can get to the right care at the right time for their mental health, wherever they sit on the mental health spectrum. So in 10 years' time, the ambition is to improve the mental health of 10 million people across the world and organizations. Amazing. Thanks very much. It's great to see you on that mission, and I wish you all the best on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like this episode, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share the episode with a friend. To keep updated on new episodes, visit impacthustlers.com and sign up for our email alerts. And also follow us on Twitter at Impact Hustlers. Thanks very much for tuning in and see you next week. This was Impact Hustlers, the podcast on entrepreneurs and change makers that are creating solutions to the world's biggest problems. Impact Hustlers is brought to you by Fast Forward 2030 and Real Changers. Visit fastforward2030.com to learn how to include the global goals into your business model and realchangers.com to find talent and careers with impact.